Mark, go with me over to the, the gospel of Mark. I want to be in Mark chapter 5 to get started with tonight. You know, sometimes our lives just get interrupted. We think we're heading one way and doing one thing, and then God shows up in a special way. And it takes us on a different pathway. You know, we've talked about this many times, but, you know, we all have a goal or a destiny or a, a purpose in life. And that purpose is before us. And our goal as believers is to try to, as straightly as we can, walk straight to Jesus, right to the goal and purpose of our life. You know, but this world is not our friends. You know, there's a war going on. You know, it, it, the Bible says that the flesh, it wars against the spirit. And that war sometimes puts bumps in the road. So much, so much so, what did James say about it? He said, when these trials and tribulations come. So we know that they're going to come because he didn't say if. He said when. And so we know they're going to come. So sometimes we're headed to Jesus, you know, kind of like this. And, and the Holy Ghost just gets, gets right in, in the way. And, and here in Mark chapter 5, we see that's what happened. You know, Jesus gives probably one of the, one of the most powerful messages that he could ever have given in, in the gospel. In fact, as he says, if you don't understand this that I'm teaching you over in Mark chapter 4, how are you going to understand anything about these parables that I'm teaching you? If you don't understand the, this parable, how are you going to understand it? And so Jesus First off, he, he, he delivers the parable about the sower. Then after he gets done, he, he goes on because he, 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 obviously his disciples are clueless. You know, They're like, hey, Jesus, that was a really good message you gave uh, you know, here Saturday morning. But uh, we ain't got no clue what it means. And he says to him, if you don't understand this one, boys, how are you going to understand any of it? So Jesus goes on and explains the parable in Mark chapter 4 and goes on and, and explains some keys to salvation. And then what does Jesus do? It says he gets in a boat and goes over to the Gadarenes, right? He goes over and, and he ministers over in that area. And then he comes back. Now, you can imagine, if, for those of you, and I know a lot of you guys have, have been around ministry for a long time, you know, at some point, you want to go home. You know, you want to kick your shoes off. You want to get out your scroll, read the book of Isaiah, right? You want to you just kick back, have some camel's milk. I don't know what they drank back then, but, but something, and just kick back and relax. And so here they come back across the Sea of Galilee, and they get out of the boat, and immediately Jesus is interrupted. Let's read, let's read here in verse, let's read here in verse 21. Chapter 5, verse 21. Now, when Jesus has crossed over again by a boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. Now, I want you to think about this. Jesus has been gone. He's been over ministering. He gets in a boat and comes back. Now, how in the world did they know he was going to get off the boat? There was a gathered there. These people didn't leave. They knew where he lived. You know, historically, he probably lived in Capernaum. I mean, historically, when you look, when you look at it, that house where he was at, where they tore the roof off, was probably Jesus' house. And when his mom came, she couldn't even get in. Remember that? So they knew he was headed back over to, civil, to their side of civilization, and they waited for him. And it says there was a great crowd that had gathered for him. Now, I don't know about you, but when I used to travel a lot in ministry and we were out doing stuff, you know, when you got home, it wasn't on the forefront of my mind, let's go find the first place we can preach a, preach a message. Let's go find some, some downtown mission work that we can do. Man, when I get home, I wanted to see my wife, wanted to see my kids, and here Jesus comes to the other side, and there's a big crowd gathered to him. And here comes Jairus. Now, Jairus is an important person. He's a ruler... You know, he's a ruler of the day. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Now, see, Jesus' day had just been interrupted. Now, sometimes our days get interrupted. 
But see, that's why it's so important to understand the word. There are no chances in God's kingdom. Things don't happen accidentally. They happen on purpose. It's what we do with the purpose that they were intended for that makes all the difference in the world. You know, when Jesus gave this message, you know, he said, he had said that, hey, I'm coming to speak in parables that those who hear won't understand, right? It wasn't that he didn't want them to know what he was talking about, but what he wanted them to do was get so hungry Get so curious, get so desirous of the kingdom of God and the gospel that now they would seek, right? Isn't that what you're told to do? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Everything we need for life. Isn't that what it also says in, in Hebrews, in, in Hebrews eleven six. Those who diligently seek him, right? Faith. Is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And, and we know that, that the worlds were framed by the word of God. We know that Abel received a better sacrifice than Cain. We know that Enoch didn't see death. And then the writer goes on to say, but without faith. It's impossible to please God. Because he who comes to him believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who sometimes read the Bible. No, to diligently seek him. And so Jesus came teaching in parables, trying to stimulate people to seek the kingdom of God. It's amazing to me that as Jesus uh, began to speak the word, those who supposedly knew the law and the prophets, who knew about Messiah, who understood the law, knew that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. How do we know? Because remember when Herod, after Jesus was born, Herod called the Pharisees under him, unto him and said, hey, man, these wise men came to me. I sent them to go and find this child that was going to be born, the king, but they haven't come back. Tell me where this child is to be born. Well, the Pharisees knew. They said that it was going to be in, uh, in Bethlehem. And so Jesus came out of Bethlehem. And so they had the prophecies, they had the confirmation, but the religious rulers were too interested in staying in power. So Jesus came and said, hey, look, it, I'm looking for the hungry. I'm looking for the lost sheep of Israel. I'm looking for those who really want to know God. Those who are more interested in, uh, in a king than the trappings of his kingdom. And so he spoke in parables. Let's go back with me to chapter 4 just for a second. I think it's in verse, in verse 12. Let's just do here in verse 12 first. Jesus said that, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn from their ways and their sins be forgiven them. He was provoking them. Do you know that that's what the church is called to do for the nation of Israel? If the church would rise up and be who she's supposed to be, the nation of Israel would want to be like the church. But the church has been so uh, per, uh, perverted by secularism and humanism and, and um, you know, um, materialism. All of these things that now all of a sudden you, you can't hardly tell the church universally from the world. We're supposed to stand out. The church should be possessing. We are kings and priests. We should be possessing the land. It's the promise in Deuteronomy 28. We should be the head and not the tail. But how many Christians are living on barely get along street? Why? Because just like the religious leaders of the day in Jesus' time, the religious leaders of the last 2,000 years have sought to keep the gospel away from the ordinary person, have sought to keep the finances away from the ordinary person so that they could keep them in bondage and keep them in trouble. And you know what? Our government today is trying to do the same thing. There is a new form of slavery. And, it, and it's socialism. It, it is taking everything they can away and then giving it back. To, the, to those who are in poverty. So what happens? A, a financial race of people. doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. doesn't matter what your ethnic background is. But now all of a sudden, I want my government check. 
and they'll do anything for it. The government writes a rule that you got to go to four different cities and get signatures from people and then show up here and you get your food and your food stamps and whatever. They'll do it. Why? Because they are now financial slaves to the system. And the church sought to do that also. When I say the church, I'm talking about universally. The, 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 you know, and it's one of the reasons why America became this, this great um, you know, test of religious freedom and liberty. Because they were tired of being oppressed by the religious uh, you know, hierarchy that was Europe. I mean, their intentions were religiously good. But religion doesn't save anybody. More wars have been fought over religion than anything else. But more lives have been saved and helped by love. By the relationship that God intended for us. And if we would shed religion and get into relationship with God... You know, I mean, people, I don't want people, you know, serving Valor Christian Center. I want people serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that servitude may be happen here, but we're, we are indentured servants to Jesus. We're not indentured servants to the church. But for years, the church said, hey, you be in, indentured to us or you're not getting to heaven. And it's a lie from the pit of hell. And so we, as the church, should be provoking just like Jesus did. We should be provoking through good works. How did Jesus provoke the religious leaders? He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. I mean, that's what the apostles did. Right? In fact, is that prayer in Acts chapter 4, I love it. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word. By stretching out your hand to heal. That signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. That is the call of the church today. And if we start operating that. You know if the dead start to rise. If the sick start walking in divine health. If our marriages stay together. If our kids grow up wanting to serve God. And being good examples. And now taking on uh, you know, the, the call of God. And, and we become, we start loving like God loves. You know, some, it's amazing to me how much the church has given away. The church is, is called to reach the poor and indigent and, and those in need. In fact, is when Paul had gone up to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles, they said, hey, remember the poor. And Paul said, this was one of the things that, that we had already decided that we wanted to do. You know, and Jesus already told us the poor will have with us always because Jesus understood the spirit of poverty. See, poverty is not a money thing. It's a spirit thing. And as long as that spirit is allowed to, to live and prevail, there's going to be poverty in the world. And that's why you can't fix poverty with wars on it. You can only fix poverty by a change in the spiritual condition. And so we as a church need to rise up. We need to rise up. Now go over with me. Oh, yeah, let's go right here, right here in verse 13. And Jesus said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand any of these parables? The sower goes out to sow the word. That is one of the most powerful statements you'll ever find in Scripture. The word. It's my word have I hid in your heart that, you, that I might not sin against you. Teach me, O Lord, your ways. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. It's the word of God. The Bible says that the word of the Lord, that, that the word of the Lord is our strength. In the beginning was the word and the word became flesh. It's the word of God that has power. That's why Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. Now, you were created in the image of God. I was created in the image of God. And that's why we have got to implement the word. But the word's not going to come out of you if you first don't sow it into you. And so it's powerful because we are going to have some interruptions in life. You know, as faith people, we, we understand Mark 11, 22, 3, and 4, right? We understand our words. We understand what it means to believe. For death and life is in the power of the tongue. 
because we're going to have some interruptions. But how we handle those interruptions are going to make all the difference in life. Interruptions that come your way that you're like, ah, this thing is just going to kill me. Well, it likely will eventually kill you. Oh, man, this one's going to make me go broke again. Well, it probably will. But when you have a, an opportunity, when you're going down the road of life like this, getting towards your goal, and, and, and the Holy Ghost interrupts it like it did here, Jesus is coming back from ministry, and all of a sudden, Jairus is there and saying, man, I got a problem. My daughter's on the verge of death. Jesus, what do I do? Now, he was a ruler of the synagogue. This is, this is a... This is a guy who knew who Jesus was. Why? Because Jesus came into his synagogue and preached Isaiah 61. For today, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty. Jesus has been in his synagogue preaching. He's been in teaching the word of God. So, so J- Jairus... He didn't run and find no Sadducee. He didn't want to go find the lawyers. He didn't go try to find the Pharisees. You remember the Pharisee? He, he's the one that goes into the synagogue and says, Oh, Lord, I'm your servant. Bestow upon me your good graces and blessings because you have made me to do well and to walk good. And Jesus said, okay, I ain't getting nothing. No, but the sinner went in, right? And he said, Lord, man, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me my sins. Jesus said, that's the kind of humility that it takes. Jairus didn't want the the first guy's prayer. He wanted a prayer that touched the heart of God. So he came after the anointed one of God. But there was an interruption in in Jesus' ministry. So now Jesus has to has to change plans. But what does he say to Jairus? Only believe. Only believe. So let's go, let's go find your daughter. So Jesus now has changed his whole plan for the day. He's headed to Jairus' house. And as he is walking through this huge crowd that had met him, and they're pressing in on him, all of a sudden he is stopped in his tracks. And he says, who in the world just touched me? Peter goes, what are you talking about, Jesus? You look around you, man, there's throngs of people. They're all touching you. He says, no, somebody touched me with faith because I felt virtue go out of me. So now all of a sudden, Jairus experiences an interruption in his life. Because Jairus has an opportunity right now. He can go, Jesus, it's wonderful that somebody touched you. I see all these people. It would be great to be a rock star like you, you know. But my daughter, remember her? I need to get you to the house now because if you don't get there now, I mean, Jairus could have gone there, right? There was an interruption in Jairus' life. Brother Copeland one time was telling a story about uh, one of his aunts who uh, ended up in the hospital and was... They said within uh, hours of dying, and he had just gotten home. He was tired, um, and he walked in the house, and his mom was all frantic and said, man, you know, your aunt's here. we got to get going. I want you to the hospital. I want you to pray for her. And Brother Copeland said, a peace just came over me. He said, I looked at my mom, and he said, all right, why don't you make me some eggs, and I'm going to go change my shirt. And she was like, didn't you hear me? So-and-so's in the hospital. We got to get there. And Brother Copeland said, she's going to be in the hospital when I'm done with my breakfast too. Right? And, it, and it's one of, I think he has, has it's two or three testimonies of people that, that he's laid hands on, that he's raised from the dead. But see, now had he come home and gotten the same spirit of fear and anxiety that his mom had gotten in, He wouldn't have been in faith. See, we got to stay in peace and in faith. When interruptions in life come our way, we got to stay in faith and peace. I mean, here four years ago, Pastor Tina and I, you know, 
we, we're doing good, running a pastoral organization, heading up. we got pastors and ministers all over the world, and, and we're fellowshipping here. I mean, we're part of this congregation, and, and uh, you know, and I've got my real estate brokerage business. I mean, it, w- it was good. I mean, those are the days, Gary, we used to get together in the morning and, and, and pray all the time, and I mean, it was, things were good. But then an interruption happened, right? Yeah, and now all of a sudden it was, well, are you guys interested in pastoring the church? Well, it's, it, you know, that, that's a different twist on my road to my purpose in life. Now, I, I guarantee you, and, and those who have been around here a long time, know that if we would have done it in the flesh, there ain't no way we'd be pastoring here. Congregation was, you know, ha- had dwindled all the way down. The, you know, the money was gone. They were losing money every month. I mean, you guys all, all know the story. You've been here for a while. And, you know, but you know what? The peace of God was on us. You know, I, and when we talked with the district overseer, we did, basically said, you know, we're not taking the church because of the money situation. God told us to take the church. We're going to take the church. And my wife said to me before we did, she goes, you realize what this is going to cost us? Well, we had planted a church before. I knew a little bit about what to expect. You know, I'd been through uh, churches that had had issues and pastors left and split. So I, I'd seen, seen a few things in, you know, 22 years of ministry at that point. You know, I'd seen some things. But none of that matters when you're in faith. So now Jairus is challenged. Well, what do I do? Because now all of a sudden Jesus is distracted. Imagine what he's thinking. He's going, man, this guy's like that golden retriever. Every time he sees a squirrel, he's off doing something. You know, he was headed home. I got him. I was the new squirrel. Now he's got another squirrel. Somebody touched him and virtue went from him. But Jesus turned and said, who touched me? And here a woman who had had an issue of blood for 12 years had lost all hope. Had spent all that she had and didn't grow any better. She just grew worse. But it says, when she touched the hem of his garment. See, she had some choices to make. First off, it was against the law for her to be outside. She couldn't be outside as a Jewish woman, you know, with a flow of blood. There was still eight days of purification once it even stopped. I mean, she was, she was potentially putting her life... Uh, I, I mean, she was basically saying, I, I'm going to die from bleeding, or I'm going to die getting stoned, but I believe. So these other things are but a thing, you know, I'm going in. And so when she touched the hem of his garment, she literally transformed herself from the kingdom of earth to the kingdom of heaven. His, when she touched his garment, she left this natural world, and entered into God's world. And we've been talking about that on Sunday, right? The pneumaticos, this, this supernatural world where, where God operates and where all things are created from. And she touched the hem of his gar- garment. And Jesus turned around and looked at her. And she told him the whole of the matter. Now, I'm not saying anything disparaging to women. But most of them don't get to the point right away. She told him the whole of the matter. I can imagine it wasn't, well, Jesus, for 12 years, I had this issue, touched her, and and now I'm healed. I have a feeling it wasn't the five-second version. So Jairus is standing over there, and Jesus looks at the woman and said, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go. Go. And then he turns back around to Jairus and goes, oh, you're still here, aren't you? And somebody comes and brings in the doctor's news. I mean, how many times have we seen that? There's no hope. You've only got four months to live. When they told my grandmother she only had six months to live, how old was she? she for six weeks, to live. how old was she? She was 90? 80? She must have been 90. She was 91 when they gave her six weeks to live. Now, at 89, she had got born again in, our, in, a, in one of our services. She had been Lutheran all her life. You know, you can be in church all your life and not be saved. 
And at 89, she got born again. At 90, she got filled with the Holy Ghost. At 91, she got a six-week death sentence. Yeah, and, and she said, God ain't done with me yet. She refused to give in to what the doctors said. And one month before her 97th birthday, she said, I'm ready to go home. You know, sometimes there's interruptions in life. The doctor's report is not the final authority on the matter. Amen? Yeah, that's right. Pastor Tina said it. It's just a report. Whose report will you believe? So Jesus and Jairus are standing there and hear the bad news. And the only thing Jesus says to Jairus is only believe. Now see, when you have an encounter of Jesus, you only need to believe. So for each and every one of us who are born again believers, we've had an encounter with Jesus. We only need to believe. Sometimes we have to look at the Lord and go, Lord, help my unbelief, man. I am believing, I am standing, I am walking, I am doing, I am being. You know, and you guys went through this with us. You know, when we, when we, when we re became, you know, the senior pastors of the congregation here, and uh, we, we've never held anything back. We came and we shared the whole of the matter. We declared this building paid for. fact is, we renamed it. We call this building paid for. We went from losing $15,000 a month with two months' worth of money left to operate with a bank ready to foreclose on us when we took over. By January, we're in the black. Hallelujah. By September, the, the, the following year, when the bank said they were going to foreclose, they were so excited about the financial condition of this church they agreed to give us a, um, an extension until they could, we could get a year in financials in, and they refinanced this building. And the finances continued to get good. Then another bank came in and said, well, now we'll refinance you and give you a better deal. It'll save you $180,000 over 10 years. Praise the Lord. Only believe. Right? All things are possible to them that believe. So Jairus was challenged. And he chose to believe God. See, when there's, when there's transition, when we run into these bumps and these, we, we run into these trials, when we run into these testings, when we run into these, these curves in the road, it does not mean that you've done anything wrong. I've heard people say that, you know. What did I do, Lord? What did I do? Well, you may not have done anything. It's just a bump in the road. It's just an opportunity for you to use your faith. I'm not saying that God brought the, the trial and tribulation, but I'm saying he'll get you through it. I'm saying he'll get you through it. In 2003, man, we, were, we, we faced a, a, a trial and tribulation. I mean, life is going good for us again. Don't get comfortable. Jesse DePlanis says, don't get on cruise control. And we're pastoring a church. We've got the largest youth group in the, in the town, that, in the small town that we're in, but we've got the largest youth group. We're having hundreds of kids come to our youth outreaches, and, and uh, the other churches in town now start having youth groups on the same night and time as we do so, because our youth group is growing so big. So, of course, that's the reason is we pick the right time and the day, you know, so let's copy that, and, 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 it, and it's going good. And then one day, head on with a semi. There's some, change, there's some trials in life sometimes. Somebody said, well, do you believe that, that God caused it to happen or allowed it to happen? No, I believe the Holy Spirit spoke to me, probably told me another way to go. But we get so busy in life sometimes. But now, I've, now we, I say I, she, she spent two years nursing me back to hell. We have a bend in the road. Right? We have a bend in the road. Doctors are telling you, you'll never walk again. You'll never walk right. You'll never be able to participate in sports. You know, your life is, is transformed. Now, for somebody who played baseball until they were 33, somebody coaching high school varsity baseball, and somebody who's involved in that kind of stuff, that's a big deal. But only believe. When these, when these turns in the road come at us, we have his word. 
It says, word never returns void, and it always accomplishes what it was set to do. So next time you face a trial or a tribulation, start getting into joy. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. And when you get into joy, there is nothing the devil, there's nothing this world, there's nothing other people can do. I tell you, the fact is, when you're in joy and they think they're putting the screws to you, it just irritates them even more. But it almost makes you want to laugh more. I mean, it just gets infectious inside of you. We have already won if we will not quit. Hallelujah. Well, Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for faith. And I thank you, Lord, that with our faith we can please you because your word says so, and therefore it is so. I thank you, Lord, that you continue to open up doors of opportunity, that you lead us and guide us each day. Give us the opportunity to continue to share the kingdom of God, Father, and advance this good news with this world. We'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.